coming up on Theater Talk. I did listen a great deal, and I was always fascinated by older people and their stories. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. Uh, New York, and indeed the world, is still in the midst of a recession, but Broadway seems to have weathered it fairly well. We're going to get a sense tonight on what's going on economically and creatively on Broadway, and we are joined tonight by two of the top, top Broadway producers. I'm very happy to have with us Jeffrey Seller, who has, is producing West Side Story, a very successful revival on Broadway now. He also produced Rent and Avenue Q, and welcome back to Theater Talk after an absence of, I think, over decade, 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Since when Rent first opened, we had you on the show. How do I look? Haven't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't changed a bit. <laughs> and still young and fresh as well, our other guest, Tom Viertel, who currently has a hit in A Little Night Music with Catherine Zeta-Jones and Angela Lansbury on Broadway. Tom has also produced Hairspray and The Producers and is working on a new production, Leap of Faith. Welcome to Theater Talk, Tom. It's a pleasure to see you. No matter how I look, I don't look as good as Jeffrey. Nobody does. <laughs> Nobody does. Um, all right. Uh, about a year or so ago, uh, there were lots of uh, gloom and doom stories in my paper in the New York Times about Broadway's going to fall apart in the midst of this recession. Uh, Tom, how well has it held up? I think quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a big article a little while ago about how people seem to be preferring to spend their money on experiences rather than on things. And I think Broadway kind of fits into that. This is, you know, it, it is a very special experience. And... Um, I think that's that's helped. Uh, attendance is a little bit down. Mm -hmm. um, there are somewhat fewer shows than there have been in some seasons, but the uh, uh, economics of Broadway have held up remarkably well. Uh, the box office is up, uh, and I think the shows that are thriving are thriving in a very big way. Yeah, Jeffrey, when when the economy took a turn last year, were you were you concerned, and are you surprised at how well something like West Side Story, for example, has done in this climate? I was happy last year that if I was going to produce a musical in, um, you know, in the belly of the beast of the, of the economic storm, it was going to be West Side Story because it was West Side Story. And I think that when consumers are anxious and they're worried, they go to what they know and they seek haven in something that's comfortable and classic. And I think that's one reason why West Side Story has been so successful on Broadway. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to think because we did it well. That is true. I mean, a lot of the shows that have closed now, Ragtime, Finian's Rainbow, I wonder even if in a great climate they really could have made it. I mean, is it not true that a really good show, no matter what the economic climate is, is going to take off on Broadway? Well, I think it depends on what you mean by made it. Uh, it's possible that a Finian's Rainbow that was really, you know, able to get love letters from virtually every critic could have run a long time on Broadway. It might or might not have literally recouped because it's an expensive show to run. People are much more careful about what they buy tickets to as a result of which they take fewer chances on things that they might not know so well. Mm -hmm. The shows that seem to be thriving are shows that are very well established, like West Side Story and Wicked, uh, The Lion King and Jersey Boys, and shows that are uh, star-driven, that right. have that have major figures that people would really love to see, like Catherine Zeta Jones and Angela Lansbury, or Daniel Craig and Hugh Jackman. If you are in this climate where the shows that people know, the titles they know, and the stars uh, are what are bringing people in, how is it possible then to do something like a rent that comes out of nowhere? I mean, all right, you had an angle, a very sad, unfortunate angle, because Jonathan died, but that's <laughs> that's not something that one is going to be uh, looking for very often in producing Broadway shows. Uh, how do you, can you push, push something new along and have the momentum that a rent had in this market? Sure. No I, stars, I, no? Well, I, I want to classify that, which is that if you're a play, that's going to be a really tough, tough game. Without because a star. Without a star, you're going to need reviews on the level of August Osage County in order to make a splash. Mm -hmm. Um, there are countless off-Broadway plays that have been receiving fantastic reviews from the New York Times over this fall. Not one of them has moved to Broadway. Uh, Ruined didn't move to Broadway That's after incredible. fantastic reviews and the Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think a musical is still a different beast, and I think if you look at our experience within the Heights over the last two years, you see here is a new musical, original material, no famous people in it, no famous people wrote it, no famous people associated with it, with it in any way, shape, or form, and um, it struck a chord with the audience such that it could come to Broadway, sell enough tickets to succeed, win the Tony, and then thrive and recoup $10 million and make millions of dollars in profits thereafter. I think that a musical is still a form that does not require any of that hoopla if it's, an original, if it's a new musical. Because the, the act of discovering a new musical, creating a new musical, creates its own gimmick, if you will, the excitement about the discovery of something new. I think that's exactly right. It creates its own gimmick. Do you agree, Tom? Well, I do agree. I think the question of how In the Heights or any of these shows would have done had they opened, let's say, last season instead of, you know, when it did open, is a legitimate question. I think buying patterns really have changed somewhat. Meaning? Well, well, I think ways. people are making safer choices. They're going to well-established brand name shows and they're going to star-driven shows and they're not so much going to other kinds of things. Now, we haven't had a really significant original musical opening of any size since you know, the, the economy went south. So there's no answer to this question that anybody could rely on. But you, you got to worry that some of the leeway that new musicals had back in 2006, 2007, before all this hit us, may have kind of gone away. No way to know. Let me ask you about ticket prices now. Uh, in the height of the big economic boom, premium prices were taken off all over the place. Do you find that you've had to scale back premium prices in shows now and that people are resisting those $200, $275, $300 tickets? I don't think I have a broad enough experience to know the answer to that. Every show really stands on its own with premium ticketing. Um, you know, we're, we, there are meaningful numbers of premium tickets being sold to a little night music. Whether there would, would, would have been more in another era or not, there's only obviously no way to tell. Um, I, w what's interesting about premium tickets, it, to me, is that when we first did it at the producers, right. the press took off on us as if we were, you know... It was the, fun. The world's worst guys, <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> and, and um, you know, everybody, all the theater owners and people like that were throwing up their hands in horror. You cannot find a show today, no matter how trivial, that it doesn't have premium ticketing and that doesn't sell some premium tickets. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable that even for shows where you can get perfectly wonderful tickets at regular prices, people prefer to buy premium tickets. They believe that it gives them something that they can't get in another fashion. It's, it's taken off. And it's the beginning of some airline model of figuring out you know, what people really are interested in paying for certain kinds of experiences. And I think in the end, it'll, it'll whatever the end means, it, it, it continues to grow as a phenomenon, this variable ticket pricing. Now when you go into a theater, if you look at the ticket pricing board, they're all televisions. Mm. And what that does is it allows uh, the producer to um, take, tinker with ticket pricing on a much more regular basis. But I do have to interject, it does bring an elitism to Broadway as it has to fly in to make the experience for a person such as myself, if I weren't getting in free, um, uh, not so fun. Whereas, you know, you could, in a fair way, get, pay your $125 a lot and maybe get a, a terrific orchestra seat. And now you have to really pay, you have to be very wealthy to get a good orchestra seat. And, uh, you know, it is kind of a turn off on some level to people. Well, I think it's a question of how aggressively you have your premium seating laid out. The, mm -hmm. the vast majority of shows have a small enough number of premium seats that it doesn't really interfere with somebody's ability to get a good seat if they're willing to stand at the box office and figure out what night there are good seats and, and the kinds of traditional things people always did. Um, I think it is an elite experience for some people and for other people it's the meat and potatoes of their cultural life and they find pricing to suit their particular... You're, you're very good on this with In the Heights, though, right? I mean, you, what is your average ticket price to In the Heights? And you know your market very well, and you know how you can pull them in with a good ticket price. How do you figure all that stuff out? Well, our average ticket price for Heights is about 80 bucks. Which uh, is a reasonable, it seems to that's me. That's a good average ticket price yeah. for that, you know, for what I'll call a medium hit. You know yeah. what I mean? Where it's, do you sit for that 80 bucks? 
Well, you can sit in the back of the orchestra for 80 bucks for 80 if bucks. you find the right discount out there. Or you can sit in the premium seat for uh, 200 bucks or 250 or whatever we're charging and, you know, and have the best seat in the house. But if you do your homework and you want to pay 125 bucks, I'm sure you can get a ticket for next week for 125 bucks and sit in a great seat in the orchestra. Um, but I think Tom's right. I think that we have so many different prices now that we can find a seat for just about anybody who has a commitment to see a play or a musical on Broadway. And that goes straight down to the $20 thing we've been doing since Rent, mm -hmm. where we sell the first row or the first two rows of the orchestra for 20 bucks. And I think Wicked still does that, and I know West Side does that, and I know Hairspray did that. And mm -hmm. I remember the days where I would literally be on the street and kids would be going, well, were you at Wicked? Were you at Hairspray? Were you at Avenue Q? And they would just kind of go around to see where they could get that $20 ticket. So um, I think that we have elitism going on, but I think we also have populism going on. And I think that all of that is very good for Broadway. It's really, it's become really what the market will bear. I mean, if a hit show is going to be able to charge higher prices for the best seats, and a modest hit is going to have to find right. a different price, yield, which is a good thing to, I think, to open it up for many people to go to shows. Yield management, which is what we're talking about, does not, is, is, the, the, the goal of yield management, of course, is to get the most money possible. But that's, but the technique of it is to balance the pricey seats on the airplane with also having cheap seats on the airplane so that what do you do? You sell all your seats. The goal with an airplane and with a theater is to sell all the seats because once the plane takes off, the seat is dead. Once that performance has happened, that seat is lost forever. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of uh, rotten fruit. Yeah. One of the things that is interesting, I, I want to change the subject just slightly, is that because premium seats exist, it allows producers to dream in a way that they never were able to before about how much money their show could make. And it, it means that you can look at a small theater and go, yeah, but if I sell 200 premium seats a night, I can still grow some million dollars. So that it, it, it has, I think, complicated uh, thinking about where to produce shows and which shows to produce in a funny way. Uh, you need to think a little more clearly as a producer than perhaps you used to to take into account what premium seating might actually do. Right. Let, me, let me just uh, throw out a couple of other issues here uh, in the f time we have left. Um, I'm always curious, being a newspaper man uh, and seeing my uh, critic friends being laid off, what do you feel as producers is the impact now of newspaper reviews. Has it been diminished? And if so, what has sort of taken its place in driving an audience to go see a show? That's a real tough question. I, I, I think it has been somewhat diminished. Um, obviously, reviews are much more important for some shows than others. Uh, and for those shows for which it's important, there's no such thing as diminishing reviews. You've got to get those reviews. Um, it, the, the, the advertising landscape has really changed. I think, you know, it's rare to find a show that could truthfully say, we're in the New York Times and that's all we really need to be, although that was certainly the case 15 years ago. Yeah, indeed, we've seen shows that have just advertised only in the New York Times and have gotten no bang for, for the buck on them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was a famous case of that earlier this season. Brighton Beach Memoirs. So, without a sort of go-to place like that, and particularly with the rise of the internet and its importance in the way people get their information, I think producers are taking a very scattershot approach to um, advertising and promoting their projects. The, the better producers, I think, pick a medium that they think for one reason or another is the right one for that show. Mm -hmm. But it's not always the same medium anymore. And in a lot of cases, a substantial amount of the budget, I would say as much as two-thirds, is spread around among everything from tourist publications to Internet sites uh, in an effort to try to get the word out. Um, what it means is that you have no very strong mode of impact unless you've picked a medium. Uh, but you do have a good deal of. Reach. And your sense of this, Jeffrey, uh, specifically with West Side Story and In the Heights, I mean, you've got a lot of interesting places to market and sell that show, those shows. Yeah, we're in transition, and I don't know where we're going. But um, I know I'm cutting my advertising budgets because mm -hmm. I believe that our dollars are have become less and less effective in directly driving sales. And at the same time, I'm. Uh, 
encouraged, frankly, by all this blogging, by, you know, we announced that, uh, you know, Corbin Blue from High School Musical was going to go into In the Heights. And um, all the bloggers did my work for me. Because literally, <laughs> from Perez Hilton to all those other teeny blogs, the word was out. Do you know how much money we would have had to spend in advertising to reach the, those millions of consumers? Mm. More money than we have. I think the days of waiting for that good review in the New York Times and then using that review to begin your campaign are over with. Don't you think you've got to start the campaign way before the press has come in to judge your show, to get the buzz and energy going for it? Sure, as long as you have a brand that's going to mean something going in, because if you don't have a brand that's going to mean something going in, you're never going to be able to break through uh, uh, the veil of indifference, well, which happened? is my term that for the absolutely. general public. That's the veil of indifference, <laughs> I love that. So, so you'll be, uh, I can't say the word, but you know, you'll be just throwing your money away. Just one more thing. Um, I'm very curious about the situation with nonprofit theaters, uh, which have grown to empires now. Now, <laughs> you guys are in the for-profit. Should we put the word evil on in front of it? Should we add a, should we add a prefix? <laughs> you guys are commercial producers. You, you, know, you, you, you gamble a lot of money. You have the uh, uh, potential to make a lot of money, or you lose it. You do not have what the big nonprofits have. You don't have the tax subsidies, and you don't have the corporate sponsorships and all these things. Do you think it's fair that a place like the Roundabout with all of the breaks that it's given from the government, from the finances, from taxes, should be doing things like Bye Bye Birdie or revivals of old plays or just putting a star in it. This is there, isn't a loaded question, that's right. incidentally. Is there now no difference between what the nonprofits are doing and what you for-profit for people are doing? I don't think there ever was much of a difference. I, I, you know, I think it's a very, very fraught issue. Um, I, I worry about the agendas of some of these theaters, no question about it. I think. The regional theater movement from which these theaters are an outgrowth really was always intended to produce new work. Mm -hmm. And as they get away from that, as they get away from nurturing playwrights and nurturing new work, I get more and more skeptical of whether that's an appropriate thing for um, us to be, in effect, subsidizing through tax breaks. Um, there are a lot of other ways in which the not-for-profits, you know, compete in in ways that we can't compete with, um, and and that's frustrating. But if they were doing great work, and if they were producing new work uh, and taking those chances, it would be hard to argue with. I think now there's more room for And your discussion. sense of this, Jeffrey? Well, at the end of the day, they're going to do what they're going to do. We're going to do what we're going to do. Uh, my biggest beef is if you want to compete for the Tonys, compete at the same price scale. And I don't think it's fair to the actors to go work at Bye Bye Birdie for 900 bucks a week or whatever the scale is when um, the actors at Ragtime and at Westside and at uh, Little Night Music are making a minimum of $1,800 a week. Now, I, I don't have my figures right. Maybe they're paying more than 900 Maybe they're paying 1100 The one thing I believe we should do for the Tony Awards, you want, you can, I'm not going to say not to compete. But you have to compete at our level. And frankly, that's something that the unions should be taking up because what's happening is they're getting a free ride toward the commercial Tony Awards that um, I think is unfair and usurious. Can you, you guys are on all these Tony committees, can you take a stand and say nonprofits cannot compete at the Tonys? Would I'm not you saying that? that. I'm saying compete on our pay scale. But if they don't, would you see, foresee a time when you say, you know what, the Tony's now going to just be for commercial productions and we'll cut the nonprofits out? Again, I think it's a very difficult issue. You know, we've lost a couple of Tony Awards recently to not-for-profits and, um, you know, that's frustrating. But, you know, in at least one of the cases, it was a superb production. And you think to yourself, well, yes, but that's a wonderful, wonderful show. And you didn't lose the Tony because their pay scale was less. No, no, no. Yeah. Absolutely not. I, I think Jeffrey makes a really good point. I think the notion that we are, in effect, competing for awards, competing for audience, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with people who are not paying the same prices we are, the same costs that we are, uh, is, is, you know, really a worry. It, 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 it's one of the many ways in which commercial producers, I think, are fighting a series of uphill battles. Interesting. All right. Um, so, Michael, we must we've invite. We've got to wrap it up. We must. We'll so invite a nonprofit 
Todd Hames, Lynn Meadow, come on and tell us why you should be able to pay actors nothing and still win Tony. Well, or no, less. <laughs> uh, we'll wrap it up by one last quick thing, Tom. Um, there's, there's sort of like a, a rule in this business that you told me you learned from a wonderful old producer named uh, Arthur Cantor. Oh, we get to tell my Arthur Cantor story. Yes. This is the only story I care about. <laughs> um, when Rocco Landisman took over Drew Jamson Theaters, he's now the head of the NEA. He's now the head of the NEA. His very first hire was my brother. And the two of them sat in Rocco's office, and a wide variety of people came to see them and say hello and introduce themselves because neither J Jack nor Rocco had been on Broadway before. And one of them was a very old producer named Arthur Cantor. He had started as a publicist, and then he'd become a producer, and he'd hung in for a 50 plus year career never having a great big hit or anything like that, but he was very well known on Broadway, and he was probably 85 when this took place. And he sat on the couch in Rocco's office, and no matter what the subject, when it was over, he would slump in his chair his, on the couch and say, I don't know, I just don't know. And that went on for 45 minutes, one subject after another. I don't know, I just don't know. He finally got up and left. And Rocco and Jack looked at each other and said, you know, there goes the dumbest producer in all of America. No matter what the subject, he don't know. But the longer we stay in the business, the more we realize Arthur was telling us everything we would ever know Indeed. about this business. He was a very wise man, Arthur Cantor. A hit, and, a flop. And my view is that we are all headed for Arthur Cantor sitting on that couch. A hit, a flop. At the end of the day, Jeffrey just... I don't know. I just don't well, it reminds know. me of something Jimmy Niederlander Sr. Yes. said to me at his own Christmas party last, you know, in December, which was, you know, my father always said it, Jeffrey. Nobody can pick them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, right. Sam Goldwyn said, you know, if they don't want to come, you can't stop them. That's right. And, that's and, that's right. think, and know, Bernie that's... Jacobs used to say, there is no limit to the number of people who don't want to see your show. Uh, <laughs> so that's what you're up against. All right. Well, uh, Jeffrey Seller, Tom Viertel, two of the finest producers working on Broadway today. Um, you guys know a little bit, but um, there's still much that we just we don't can't don't know. figure out. Thanks a lot for being our guest on Theater Talk. <laughs> so how did you get into uh, this wacky business? Yeah. Well, you know, it's like that old joke about the... The, the man who visited a brothel and asked uh, this lovely young woman he was with who turned out to be a PhD, the author of several bestsellers and, you know, just ravishing intellectual. How does a girl like you get in a place like this? She said, just lucky, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And take Sherman Edwards. He's got a walk daddy and a colored mother. Now, when they all go to heaven together, what's going to happen? How do I know, huh? I'll worry about things like this. <laughs> because my daddy died and my mama's married again. I got to wondering last night who was going to be her husband in heaven. Kept me awake half the night. Read the Bible. All that's in the Bible. Someplace. <laughs> I hope so. The way it looks to me now is that everything's going to be real mixed up in heaven. A real highlight of this theater season is Horton Foote's The Orphan Cycle at the Signature Theater Company. Now, this is a three-part, nine-hour epic that has gotten some terrific reviews. And I know, Susan, it's a particular favorite of yours this year. Oh, it's absolutely wonderful. And going into it, I thought, oh, nine plays? I don't want to do this. But I, I could do more and more. It was wonderful. Well, he's a, a wonderful writer, Horton Foote. He died last year, sadly. But we had him on the show not too long ago when his play Dividing the Estate was on Broadway. Yes, this may have been his last interview. And I think it was it, his last interview. He was, his daughter, Hallie Foote, who appears in The Orphan Cycle, told us about this project, which he was working on right before he died. Your father's incredibly prol prolific, mm -hmm. right? 60 some. Some plays, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, he lives with you now in, in mm -hmm. California. Yeah. Is he writing every day? He writes. So he's right right now. He's um, working on a. He, he's he wrote these nine plays called the Orphans Home Cycle. Mm -hmm. um, it's based. It sort of traces his father. Uh, I said it. You didn't ever go into therapy. This was his therapy with his father. So we're working. Was out. his father in an orphan's home? His father was semi-orphaned. His mother married someone else and didn't take her with him. Mm. So he was kind of on his own at about eleven or twelve. And. Um, it begins with the death of his father's father, and it ends with the death of his mother's father. That's the, mm. and it's based on a poem, a uh, Marion Moore poem. All, all, there's a line, "All the world's an orphan's home." The world's an orphan's, the world's home. an orphan's home. Mm. Anyway, he's he's uh, 
they're getting ready to do it. Michael Wilson wants to. Who directed this mm -hmm. device? Oh, yeah. yeah. They want to do it. Um, well, he's talented, don't yeah. you? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. He's yeah. brilliant director. <laughs> he's very talented. So they want to do it like a coast of utopia, like a nine hour kind of. Oh, the they're important foot uh, epic cycle. Mm -hmm. I did listen a great deal, and I was always fascinated by older people and their stories. Mm. And most of their stories were about things like this. Who's got this, and who's going to get this, and who's going to, you know. So you were a little quiet little boy just in the corner right, yeah. watching this? And it's, and I think, I don't know how they feel about me now, <laughs> uh, but I don't try to be specific. I try to accumulate mm. and then find a new person. When I was three years old, my baby sister Jenny died with diphtheria. Mama was pregnant with Laura then, and they had her in bed resting, and Papa's sisters from Galveston came to take care of us. And Aunt Lucy took me in her arms to show me Jenny in her coffin, and I got hysterical. Mama doesn't even have Jenny's picture in the house any longer. It's hidden away at the bottom of her cedar chest. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.